I'm starting my live stream now. It's three o'clock. And I also need to start my concurrent live stream on Instagram TV, which I have my phone suspended over my laptop here. So let me just get that stream started and then we'll begin with uh, open studio time. Hi friends, welcome. It's time for open studio stream here at La Brica Luce. My name is Rachel Pollock. I'm located in Durham, North Carolina in the United States. And today, let me make sure that this is really recording. Yes, I think it is. Well, if you're joining me on Instagram, if you can leave a comment so that I can see that this is actually recording. And uh, same for um, same for the folks on YouTube. If yeah, okay, I'm I'm definitely recording on YouTube. I can never tell on IGTV because I've had it record and then lose the video. I've had it not record and just pretend to because we had crappy connectivity. I don't know, um, but I can tell there are folks on YouTube. So welcome, viewers. Um, it's Open Studio Stream, and I am reverting my focus this week back to the Regency Spiral Straw Bonnet that I had been working to working on for two weeks here in Open Studio time, but um, I last week I switched focus because some of my students. Oh, hey, it's Kim Fraser on YouTube. Hi, Kim. Welcome. Good to see you. Um, last week, I because my students voted for it and I started this stream to help them have opportunity to watch me work, they voted to block straw cloth on this brand new block of mine. So that's what I was demonstrating last time. And it, it was it was not successful, but it was a successful learning experience because what I demonstrated to start with, my plan had been to block it in either Pinock Pock or Cinema, which are both woven flat straw pieces, well, it's sold on rolls, that you can use to create mostly contemporary millinery and the fibers of that come from the hemp plant in both Pinock Pock and Cinema straw. And because it comes on a roll instead of a formed hat body like a cone or a capoline, um, I was illustrating with brown paper how to determine how much straw cloth you could you would need to cut off. And so in the stream, I started thinking I was going to figure it out in paper and then I'd have my piece and I'd cut it out in the straw cloth and then I'd block it. But it in the course of figuring out how to mold the paper over the block and thinking about the properties of Cinema and Pinock Pock. I ultimately decided in that essentially making a mock-up with paper that these corners were far too sharp for any way for me to reconcile them in a quality fashion. So what I wound up doing was that that was the course of the stream, of course, you know, I always think I'm going to be able to do twice as much as I do. So if you're interested in that, that's last week's stream. But this week, I'm returning to the Regency bonnet that is being, I'm making it with spiral straw. And this started because I received a donation of vintage hats that included one with this beautiful open work straw braid medallion. And the hat was crushed, the bra was, the, the braid was damaged past that tip medallion, but I wanted to salvage this beautiful motif here and repurpose it for the tip of a bonnet crown. I'm giving a lecture in March on millinery in the time of Jane Austen, and so I want to have, I want to have this bonnet as a, a visual aid for that lecture. So um, if you've attended or if you watched any of the previous streams on this bonnet we talked about why i have measured with millimeters the proportions of the elements of the crown and then measured the elements of this crown to to check as to whether i've got 
the depth of the crown and the width of the brim, what I'm going to need to be shooting for measurement-wise. Um, that's a little bit of, of, of math there for you when you do these um, ratios where you figure out what the denominator is. And uh, so I now have a set of measurements that I'm shooting for in terms of getting this bonnet to basically approximate this shape. And what you've what what has happened in the intervening time where i'm at now with this is i've completed you know recollect that to start with i hand stitched the the wide braid to the vintage medallion for a couple of rows and then i was able to do maybe six rows of this crown on the machine before I really needed to take it out from under the sewing machine's presser foot and sew this flare area by hand. And so I've, I've finally transitioned from the straight side band of the crown to where the brim is going to flare up. And, and I've also reached the depth at the center back that this crown has. This doing my little ratios this measurement from the back of the crown to where there's an opening for your neck is uh, i need it to measure 12 mil or 12 centimeters and so just right before this stream i took this measuring tape that has um you know inches on one side and centimeters on the other and i measured that center back distance which if you look inside here, you can also see where I've got a, a little black stitched tack to, to indicate where center back is. So that in terms of moving forward with braid construction on the bonnet shape itself, I can you know measure equidistant to either side of that and then begin stitching spiral braid in arcs here. And I think, I don't know because I've never made one of these, I'm, I'm just sort of logistically thinking through it in my brain because as a theatrical milliner, you often are in a position to have to manufacture something that you have never done before. And so thinking through the techniques that I'm going to use from here forward, knowing that I can now get this on the free arm of my sewing machine, uh, rewind, let me say that I, just before this stream, I also, I had to, the, where the, this braid ends and it, it sort of coasts down underneath the row before it and becomes a, a smooth edge. Where that braid dips down back into, where is it? Now I've lost it. Where that braid dips down back into the inside of this crown, I wanted to stabilize that with a row of machine stitching to really anchor the end of that braid before I move on to a second hank of braid to start arcing this brim out. So I, I positioned my sewing machine. I'm working with a domestic sewing machine here. I don't have one of those specialty uh, straw braid stitching machines, which I covet and I, I have a, a perennial search on eBay for them. They pop up every now and again. They seem to go for around, start at $300 if they are in working order up to 800, I've seen 800, 900 for some really good quality antique ones. Well, they're all antiques. They don't make those anymore. Um, but someday it it is my goal to buy one of those, which I, I believe actually, if you'll just permit me a little bit of digression here, I believe that I am a step closer to that goal because today, literally just maybe 30 minutes ago, um, I, I have had my townhouse on the market and I received a, an offer on it and we have moved forward on the selling process and I closed that sale just today. So fingers crossed, nothing happens with the deed transfer and I've sold the townhouse finally, which this has been, thanks to this pandemic, it has been delayed by five months. Um, like my, my initial plan was to get it on the market in May and, and sell it then. But um, of course there was delay after delay because 
of COVID-19 and, you know, you need to get cosmetic repairs done before you list it. And then you need to get things that they find in the, the home inspection. And so I dragged out, but now. I have finally sold it. And that means that I'm actually going to be in a pretty decent um, financial situation for somebody who's working in theater where theater doesn't even exist anymore for the time being. So I feel like I could, thank you, Kim. It, it is it's such a relief. <laughs> um, uh, I feel like I could drop three to $500 on an antique straw braid sewing machine sometime in the next year or so once I figure out what my new financial state is going to be now that I've unloaded this piece of real estate that had been drawing a lot of my income and not generating anything. And anyway, we're very excited about this to, to get that thing sold. Um, but to get back to this bonnet here and the fact that maybe someday soon I'll have a straw sewing machine, but now I do not. Um, when I sewed the rows of the sideband on the sewing machine. I was sewing with the presser foot on the inside going, so I'm rotating it around like this until I got so far in that the top part of the machine prevented me from sewing any further down the crown. And that's when I started sewing by hand. I sewed maybe five or six further revolutions of the braid by hand and then I just was able to, once I stabilized this braid, I was able to take my domestic sewing machine, move it over so that the bulk of it was sitting on the edge of the table, but the free arm, the sleeve arm was sticking out into space at the edge of the table so that I could basically stick that sleeve arm up inside of the hat and then the presser foot was coming from this end with the bobbin thread on the inside. And I did a back and forth to tack down the very edge of where this braid dips below the opening of the bonnet. What is now the opening of the bonnet? Now the plan is that the next step of construction on this is I'll measure equidistant from the center back black tack there and by machine be stitching on the outside of the bonnet braid that goes back and forth and and folds back on itself each time it comes to the end of the arc so that's my plan we'll see if it works out i'm, I'm expecting to do that to have the free time to do that this week coming up maybe we're in a position at at the university where uh tuesday of this coming week is the last day of classes and my class has been um, asynchronous online delivery anyhow. So really I don't have, other than answering my students' final questions that might pop up in the course forums or emails that they send me, I don't have any active responsibilities with respect to that class until the week of Thanksgiving when the semester ends and they present their final projects. So I have a little wiggle room in that week, the, in the forthcoming week from the end of classes to through exam week because my exam is on the last day. Um, and I'm expecting to be able to machine sew a significant part of that bonnet arc that week. We'll see if that happens. But Today, my plan for what I wanted to do in this stream is, I guess it was, I, yes, it's on Fridays. A, a, a colleague and friend and former mentor of mine, Denise Wallace Spriggs, who is a milliner at the Huntington Theater in Boston. She, she was the first milliner that I apprenticed to as an assistant, and um now I'm a milliner myself and have been for however long and, and we're colleagues, but you know, it's that, um, that relationship that happens when somebody's that somebody that is your teacher becomes your colleague and how there's always, um, or at least for me, there's always a sense of looking up to them and respecting their, uh, talent and, and skills. So that's to say that 
Denise does a live studio stream every Friday afternoon over on Facebook Live. And I attend it when I can, and I did attend it last Friday. And she was talking about Spiral Straw. So that was really timely and exciting. And um, if, you're, if you're interested, I think her page is Study Millinery with Denise Wallace Spriggs and the, the live streams, much like mine, hers archive over on Facebook, mine archive on YouTube, and sometimes they show up on IGTV. I, I can't really figure that out, or I haven't been able to figure out what makes it save it on Instagram so far, but you can definitely find past live streams on the Open Studio Stream channel or Open Studio Stream playlist on my YouTube channel. Um, but so if what I'm about to describe sounds interesting to you, just pop over to her, her Facebook and watch the stream. Um, she has a, she had acquired, um, hey, Creative Costume Academy, I see Trisha's here. Hi, Trisha, over on Instagram. Um, she acquired a significant collection of straw braid for making these types of hats. And she was essentially just sort of unpacking a box. It was like an unboxing almost, um, or an uncovering. She was showing examples of all these different types of beautiful colors and, and types of braid and materials. Like they're not just straw, but there was also um, horse hair and Toyo paper straw, cellophane, nylon, uh, polypropylene, it was, it's a great survey of different types of braid that exist that you can buy brand new to make these spiral construction hats. And she also talked about ways that you can manipulate the braid to get different effects. And one thing which I actually passed on to one of my own graduate students who is doing a spiral construction hat as her capstone hat project um, hi, Sherry, if you're out there watching one of these streams. Um, Sherry's doing a spiral construction hat that in her research image, the braid alternates in color. So it looks striped. It looks like kind of like this black and white striped hat, spiral straw hat that I was working on at the beginning of these streams. And But hers in the research image, it's every other row is a different color. And she had been sort of thinking about do I have to tie each, do I have to secure each one down before I start the next one and and how to negotiate that transition between one color and the next and in Denise's stream which I passed this recommendation on to to um, Sherry because I didn't think of it myself but it's so obvious now that she said it out loud was that you sew like if you're alternating between tan and navy you sew the tan to the navy for you know the the duration of the length that you need and then you treat that doubled braid as a single braid so it automatically turns into an alternating stripe and i was like oh that's so genius <laughs> but the thing that inspired me that i wanted to work on on today's stream was she had a very narrow straw braid similar to this one that i salvaged from well, I don't need to take that off of here. Um, similar to this narrow braid that I salvaged from this vintage open work medallion hat. So recall that that sideband was crushed and damaged so that, so that the braid was not continual in a certain space. Like it was for a while and then there were a few short pieces and then there was more that was continual as I unspiraled it. And in salvaging that, I wound up with two, I think I had two hanks of this narrow braid. One was way longer than the other. And Denise showed an example of this type of braid that hers was an antique, beautiful leghorn straw braid. Um, but she talked about ways to, you know, when you work with this really skinny braid, it can be difficult because it's so skinny that as you stitch each row of the spiral, you just don't get that much real estate in the depth of the hat that you're creating. It takes forever if you sew the skinny braid in single rows. And so 
one thing she mentioned was that you could create you could make a thicker one by just sewing this to itself and having like a triple depth and go faster which is interesting from a theatrical perspective because you could delegate that sewing of the braid to itself that there's no you need to have the skills of, so, of operating a sewing machine, but you don't need to have the sculptural skill of manipulating the braid where it flares out or, or where it needs to be equal distant depth or, or be scrunched up underneath itself further to get the kind of difference in the shape that you're making that you do once you're assembling these. And I thought, oh, that would be really great because you could take this skinny stuff, sign up for a stitcher, uh, or have your assigned stitcher just process it into a triple width or quadruple width wider braid and then work with that. <sighs> Brilliant. Um, but the thing, that's not the thing that I want to talk about most specifically or that I'm about to do most specifically was she demonstrated how, I can't remember if she demonstrated or she just had a swatch and showed us, showed the viewers that you can take this skinny braid and braid it and turn it into a double braided, like it's, it's braided and then you braid with the braid. And then you have a, a wider braid that also has an interesting sort of scalloped nature to it. If you're doing like a three strand braid, you know how a three strand braid has alternating scallops where each place curves back into the braid each piece curves back into the braid and I thought that is a fantastic idea for how I could take the braid from the back of this and I had always been thinking I would use some of this little narrow braid to create straw trims like little straw flowers um, maybe just bands single bands of it around a broader ribbon hat band, you know, something like that. But once Denise mentioned on her stream the prospect of turning narrow braid into a wider braided strip, I thought, okay, that is actually something that once I created braided yardage, I could add, once we get out here into the bell of this bonnet, like I'm not exactly reproducing this bonnet. This bonnet is my inspiration for shape but i i had always been thinking like oh maybe once i get out here i could piece in a stripe of the narrower braid or some other type of braid um, just for visual interest for for the cool decor of it and then i thought oh if i can braid some of that narrow braid that matches the tip open medallion then at a certain point i could stop using this wide straw braid this wide straw braid sorry i'm it's landscape on youtube and it's not it's portrait on on instagram so it's it's hard to, to it's hard to play to both audiences <laughs> but anyway i could stop i could get to a certain point in the brim stop using this wide braid piece in a strip of the braided narrow braid and then go back to this wide braid and I just have an interesting um, detail there in the structure of the hat that would be an element of ornamentation that would not be present if I just used nonstop the wide braid. So this week earlier, you know, I said I had two hanks of this narrow braid and this is the, the shorter of those hanks. The other one was much larger from unspiraling that vintage hat. And I took the longer one and I'm not going to move my camera to show you, but I think you can see definitely on the YouTube channel that I have a four poster bed in this room. This room is normally our guest room. Um, won't be having guests for a while, thanks COVID-19. So I've reappropriated this space as my workspace. And so this four poster bed that's right here, the, the steel frame, I think it's steel, um, these posts go all the way up to um, a, a big rectangle that could be a canopy if you draped, you know, mosquito netting over it or, or whatever. 
Um, and so I took my narrow straw braid and I taped one end to the bedpost at the foot of the bed and wrapped it around from one bedpost to the other until I ran out of braid because my goal was to cut that long piece down into three equal lengths so that I could set it up to braid. And, and I did that. And then I took each one of those three lengths and I bound it up in to a little hank itself. And there's like a, an elastic tie holding it in place because what I'm gonna do today is I've tied the three of them together in a knot and I'm going to clamp this to my table with this little clamp here. Love these, love these. They come in all different sizes and you get them at like Home Depot and stuff because they're, they're meant to clamp, you know, wood together where you're doing veneers or something. But um, I love them in a millinery context because I, I like all different sizes of clamps because sometimes you need to clamp a wire to some buckram. Sometimes you need to clamp a straw braid to the next piece of straw braid. And these little alligator clips that you can find in the electric section for attaching naked wires to each other when you're doing wiring projects. They're great if, especially if what you need to attach, if it would behoove you to have teeth on your clamp. Um, but I like these because you have a wider range of, it, they'll open up wider and clamp a lot of stuff together. But they also have these surfaces that are hinged so they can clamp something where one piece it, where they're not exactly parallel to each other if you have an angle they'll accommodate that and so I'm going to use this to clamp this secured braid to the edge of my work table here which you can see on Instagram what I'm doing and I think you can't see it as well on um, or you can see on YouTube what I'm doing but I think on Instagram you can't see it as well because of the portrait orientation but you can imagine I mean I'm clamping it to the edge of the table and then I'm going to braid this braid these three hanks of braid into a new length of straw braid that will hopefully Ah, allow me to add a new decorative element to the Regency bonnet once I get far enough to, to be at the edge of the visor. Now I have to do some untangling here. Um, if you do follow me on Instagram, you may have seen a couple of days ago, I think I posted um, when I negotiated getting these um, prepared for today's stream. I had them sitting out here on the work table, and I should have foreseen this issue. Um, my cat, Riley, bless his heart, he is such a sweetie, but he's also, as most cats are, a mischievous little demon. And he loves to, there's a, mirror, a, a window right here, and he loves to, um, Oh, you know, uh, people are commenting in Instagram and I can't or I can't see what the comments are. That's frustrating. Um, like I can see that somebody just said something, but it didn't roll up on the bottom. I'll have to figure that out. Um, so Riley, trying to look out this window, jumps up here. Mess. Mess. So all of these artfully uh, arranged little hanks of straw braid then became tangled in his little fuzzy feet. And um, it, it would have been sweet if it hadn't pissed me off. But anyway, let me move my head and the crown out of my physical space here because I need to get some distance on this braid to manipulate it. 
I really would love to figure out how I could see those comments that are happening on Instagram because usually they run at the bottom and I can read them as you comment, but anyway. I also can't figure out how to retain the comments on Instagram because um, even when it manages to save my feed, it doesn't keep them or even when it saves the video, it doesn't keep the comments. So it's been a while since I've braided hair. I will admit to that. Um, it's been a while since I've had enough hair to braid because prior to this uh, COVID-19 situation and the inability to go to the hairdresser, um, I had very short hair. It was like kind of, kind of like, kind of mannish, I suppose. Um, actually, you know what it was? Um, if I'm honest, I think that the, the name that I've seen for the style is the fashy because so many of these fascist douchebags have this haircut where you only have hair on the top of your head and you shave all around the sides and the back of your head. Um, I don't know why they prefer that haircut, but anyway, it, it was something that I, for one thing, I have always cut my own hair for the most part. Um, and then I started going to a hairdresser because if you've watched this stream for a while or you know me personally, you know that I have pretty severe carpal tunnel. And when it flares up, sometimes it can be a challenge to even just put my arms over my head. And I had, I had decided that what I needed to do was um, have somebody cut my hair for me for a while. And then there was a pandemic. And so then I decided that what I was going to do is um, just let my hair grow out. But all of that is to say that I haven't braided hair in quite some time. And so trying to negotiate, ah, what's happening here is, it's not quite second nature to me. I guess there was a while, there was a while ago, maybe 20 years ago, I braided hair quite frequently um, because I had um, braided in hair extensions and I, did them for other people too. So I was very accomplished at braiding back in the 90s. But, and you know, it is, uh, as I'm discovering here, as I'm working on this, it is somewhat like riding a bike in that once you know how to do it, you can pick it back up again. But I know, I, uh, boy, I would have been so much faster at this um, back when I was braiding tons of hair um, but I'm still managing. And so I'm observing a few things as I am conducting this braiding process. And I'm, I'm braiding along the table from right to left. If I were braiding actual hair, I would want to, to clamp it somewhere over here and braid out towards myself. But I decided when in thinking about how I was going to negotiate this, I decided that I wanted to braid this straw braid, straw millinery braid from left or from right to left because I want to be able to control the braid itself so that I'm not folding it back on itself, but so it's always remaining flat side out and is just wiggling like this. Um, instead of folding each time I take a braid and fold it over or, you know, move it into the center of the three strand braid. Um, I, I want to maintain a, a flatness of that braid. So that's what I'm trying to do here. And it's working so far, but I have to, if to be able to do that, 
have to use my finger to press down on it to keep the braid taut and flat in its position here. So moving that one in there. I really need to figure out what's changed about Instagram. Because the very first two times, two maybe, yeah, the first two times, well, not the, the very first time I had my orientation wrong and I was trying to stream landscape, which is just not a thing on Instagram. So um, that kind of sucked. But the first two times I successfully streamed on Instagram, it was great. And I could read the chat as it was happening and interact with the folks there. And now it's like in the most recent update or something, they changed it so you can't like I get a notification I see that I see that Jessamy was slash is in my stream over on Instagram that's an old friend of mine we went to undergrad together um, and she said something but I don't have any idea what it was because Instagram wouldn't let me see it so that's frustrating It's funny, I thought this was going to go so fast. No. <laughs> it's like, oh, I will braid this whole length by the end of that video. And now that I've got my technique down, I am going faster, but I don't, you know, I'll be lucky, I think, if I, I'll be lucky if I get 18 inches of this braid done. I think because what time is it? Oh, it's 3.37. Well, yeah, I'll be lucky if I get 18 inches of this done. Um, I had been thinking, oh, I'll just bust that out. But I, I had not considered this issue with needing to keep the braids straight. And I'm always thinking about like all of these projects that I do on these studio streams so far they're not for the theater um, we do have a show that's running right now uh, it's live reading it's it's a staged re or not a live reading but it's a staged reading of a play called the storyteller that won Thomas Wolfe playwriting award um, I was on the reading committee for that award, so I read, I think I wound up reading, every, we'd, every reader didn't read every script, you know, you were in little pods where you would have eight scripts that you needed to read, and then you'd choose, like, the two best ones, and then the next round you'd have six scripts that you needed to read, and you'd choose the one best one. Anyway, um, until we get up to the last final however many scripts, I think it was 10. Um, once you get to the 10 finalists, and that went to like, we had a celebrity judge who was, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say her name because I'm gonna get it wrong if I do, but she's a graduate of UNC Chapel Hill who has gone on to become a script writer and a playwright. And she's on some famous show that's getting made in, or that was getting made in Hollywood. But she also wrote, um, if you're local to UNC Chapel Hill and Playmakers, then um, you might have seen a show a couple of years ago called The Cake about a, a, a devoutly Christian woman who was in a position to bake a cake for her stepdaughter, but then her stepdaughter turned out to be marrying another woman and she struggled with her own morality and thinking that that was wrong. Should she bake a cake for her stepdaughter? It was a good play. It was a really good play because it... Um, really illuminated the position of all the characters like you understood what they were all struggling with it didn't demonize the baker and it didn't demonize the lesbian couple that was getting married it was very it was very good anyway the woman who wrote that show was in our celebrity uh, judges panel or, or in our finalist judges panel she was I guess the celebrity judge because the others were like staff members of playmakers that are higher up the the ladder corporate wise than i am i guess not corporate since we aren't a corporation but 
the the ladder of of who reports to whom it was several people above to whom I report that were reading these finalist shows um, and so that's all a big digression to say that the show that we're running at work right now is a live uh, a, a uh, filmed staged reading so our actors um, rehearsed it for I think they rehearsed for maybe a week because you don't have a live performance there's no blocking there's just you're delivering your lines but on zoom you can have your lines right here next to your camera and be reading them um, but they did do a certain amount of, of really um, creatively interesting stuff with taking it's not just like you're watching a zoom like there's the person who's speaking to their camera and they cut them out and stick them in a, a landscape that is relevant to what they're talking about so the show takes place on a, a houseboat this uh, man and his daughter live on a houseboat in the middle of i i want to say Oh, I'm I'm not gonna pick the right um, I'm not gonna pick the right city, but it's obviously it's a coastal city, and um, it might be New York City, uh, but anyway, they have an image of a houseboat, and then they open up little windows with people speaking their lines, and it's it's really good. I started watching it uh, yesterday, and I haven't I haven't finished it yet. That's one thing that I appreciate about. Um, theater in the age of pandemic and is you know when you go to a show live in a theater and you're crammed into the audience with 500 other people or 1500 other people or however big the house is and you're watching it but suddenly you think I have to go to the bathroom or I really wish I'd gotten a glass of water you can't do that like you well you could you could climb over 20 audience members to get out and go to the bathroom and, and they would all be really pissed at you but um i do like that that with streaming a theater performance i can have some control over pause it and i'm gonna you know go get a snack or pause it because i need to go do something else or eat dinner and go to bed and come back to it. So that's all to say that I haven't watched all of the story, this um, this staged reading of the storyteller that's running right now. I believe it, it only runs for a week, the 9th through this Sunday, I believe. Um, you can get tickets on our website if it sounds interesting to you. I did enjoy the script. I remember this script was one of the ones that I had to read in my um, reader's pod. And, and I did recommend that we pass it on up the ladder. So it must have made it all the way up the ladder of important readers who make programming decisions um, and to win the contest. So congratulations to the playwright on that. Um, but to get back to what I was saying about the fact that these hats so far that I've, that I work on in these studio streams are not for playmaker shows because so that the storyteller the staged reading they're i think there I, I saw a couple of props but for the most part you know your performer on on this staged reading at least it's like shoulders up in in a, a zoom camera and there is really no elaborate costuming now next semester in the in spring semester, which when it will still be January and February, so it'll not be spring, but um, the hope is that the pandemic will be such that we can not have live theater, but we can do more planned filmed theater. So the storyteller is a staged reading like I said so you never would expect that to have production values like a set and costumes and props and stuff even if we were doing that as a staged reading like 
come to our theater and sit here and watch our actors sit in front of music stands and read the play. Um, it would always be something kind of like what it is now. I actually like this storyteller staged reading on Zoom better than some of, in terms of production value, better than some of the staged readings that I've attended in person where you do have just a room full of actors sitting in folding chairs in front of music stands. Like they have bothered to do some sound design and some video editing. And, and it's, it's an interesting hybrid of, of cinematography and, and um, a staged reading. So it's, it's pretty good. Um, it's better than pretty good. It's good. It's straight up good. But hopefully in the fall, we're doing, now I know I'm not involved in the first one, Edges of Time. It's a world premiere of a new script by one of our faculty members um, about, um, takes place during the 60s and it's about an, a black woman who I think lived here in Durham, North Carolina and did something instrumental with respect to civil rights that, you know, her story has sort of disappeared in the, the white supremacist rewriting of history as things have done. And um, this play re-illuminates her life for the people that watch it. And so that's going up, I think it's early February, but that's one performer and they're hoping that COVID will be such that they could film that on a stage or in a, in a location and edit it and turn it into something even more formally put together than this staged reading that we're running right now is. But it's the second show of the spring semester that has the possibility for me to be able to work on Playmaker's costumes here on the live studio stream because I intend to keep this running. Like, uh, our, our classes end before Thanksgiving. I won't be streaming on Thanksgiving. That is a thing worth noting. I won't be streaming on Thanksgiving itself because it's a holiday, so I'm taking it off. Um, so that week there won't be a studio stream. But the week after, the month of December, I plan on, on continuing this stream because I won't have finished this bonnet. You know, okay, I've gotten, we're at, what, 347? Okay, I've got about 14 inches here, so I might get all the way across the table. But each one of these hanks, I still have loads of length. Um, so I think what I want to do now take my little clamp and move my braid and then reclamp oh come on reclamp my braid really is this gonna be aha there we go reclamp <laughs> this is a comedy of errors um come on it worked just a minute ago oh, there we go um but I think this illustrates this project is going to be something I'm working on for quite some time. Um, and into December, I won't necessarily film all of it because I don't think that me demonstrating that I can, in fact, braid braid into a bigger braid is, is not very fun to watch. I mean, it's okay for this stream, but I wouldn't do like three streams of just me creating more yardage of this braid. Um, but once the braid exists, you know, like that hat will move forward. So that's my plan is, is to spend December completing that Regency bonnet and maybe also whatever else comes up that might interest me to work on. But if we're able to actually produce as you like it in the way that they are hoping, then I know that I will have probably millinery projects delegated to me because we just had um, a meeting about how that what the designs are on that show and how we will work on it and I don't want to offer any spoilers because it hasn't been announced to the grad students yet but I believe that one of the grad students is going to be chosen to essentially be the head of crafts on that show 
and be in charge of because there's there's a lot of crafts in the design for as you like it they're setting it i want to say three years after the tulsa massacre that happened in oklahoma at the beginning of the 20th century uh, when a bunch of racist white people killed a bunch of black people living in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And so this play, this version of As You Like It is set a couple of years after that, I believe. And so that sort of is hanging over all of the characters at the time. Uh, and I'm interested to see how that plays out as um, a reinterpretation of Shakespeare. But... Um, the design, so it's set in like 1921, I think. The design has a load of really cool mat, or really cool hats, and probably some interesting dye projects and such. And it also has a collection of um, World War One gas masks that are worn by some of the characters. I think. Um, a, sig a significant number of those. So I think there's a certain amount of these crafts that are going to need to be done on site in the facility, which the graduate students do have access to and are able to sign up for work time. And then there is a, a significant number of them that are portable, that can be packed up and, and delegated to me because I think what we're going to do to handle the crafts on that show is give someone the opportunity to to basically be in charge and treat me as their assistant when in normal times I use them as my assistant or as my co-collaborator and we split the load up like I'm going to do all of the handwork crafts and you're going to run the die shop and do all of the messy stuff um, or whatever you know I've, I've had more often I have a student who is very interested in being the milliner on the production and doing all the hats, and then I take care of everything else. Um, of course, that always changes. <laughs> you know, you you say you're going to mix it up that way, and then suddenly it's you know 7 p.m. and I'm not there, but they need something dyed for tomorrow, and that person who's still around just takes it on and dyes it, even though it's not their responsibility. And, and that's how theater is. You know, you have to kind of roll with what comes. Um, and, and I think that we are actually, in terms of rolling with what comes, I think that we've got a good plan for rolling with this pandemic for how we're going to do a season where we can't all sit in the theater together. Well, we can't all just be in the theater together, much less have an audience sitting there. Um, in, the, um, in the chat on, on YouTube, I see that Kim has said, I'm dying to see how one makes gas masks for theater. <laughs> well... I suspect that, you know, I, I will have to confer with the student who is set to be in charge on that and also confer with our manager as to what the budget is on that show. But my instinct that the, the look of those World War I gas masks, you know, those are the ones that there's a, a, a gum rubber face shield with round eye holes that looks very much like a plague doctor sort of mask and then there's like a one canister a singular canister that's that's right here so it's it's like a almost a skull like face with this can hanging off of it that straps onto your head and i you can still buy a lot of of that sort of surplus and and you can also buy replicas because for every war that has ever existed there are historical reenactors and interpreters who dress up and recreate the battles every year almost um, and so you can you can often find really good replica stuff for pretty affordable prices so I imagine that what we would do in that in that case with these specific World War I designed gas masks, and I am just talking out my ear here of what I would do, I think, is I would look around for who's selling those replicas for an affordable cost 
buy those and then figure out how to alter them so that they do what the actors need them to do because you know a gas mask from that time period is supposed to protect you from the chemical weapons the early really janky bad chemical weapons well all chemical weapons are janky bad um but you know you have rudimentary chemical weapons you have rudimentary gas masks perfect to protect you and they have i expect in world war one they strap onto your head with buckles that you don't necessarily even have uh, elastic straps at that point necessarily i don't know i'd have to check the history on that um I'm sure there's someone who is a, a World War I history buff that can hop into the comments, you know, 10 years from now and tell me how full of crap I am on that. <laughs> but no, I, I would look it up and confirm. But I bet you they have some sort of configuration that it, for holding them onto your head that was the height of, of technology at the time and is archaic now. And in fact, our folks, sometimes they need to put them on and take them off with one hand and not mess up their wig or whatever. And, and the negotiation of that is something that I think whoever is in charge of, I say whoever, like I don't know, I'm just not naming her because she hasn't been told yet. Um, whoever's in charge of this project, they would need to negotiate that on site when they have fittings with the actors of like, what is the action that you do when you take this on and off or put it in the rehearsal notes so I know to change the configuration from it's on a pair of eyeglasses so you can just put it on your face or it's got a, a strap that elastic strap that goes underneath the occipital bone at the back of your head or it's mounted on a cap because you have to put it on like a ball cap. Those are all things that she would be asking the performer either in the fitting or we would ask it in, in notes that are sent to the director through stage management. And she'd need to negotiate that on site in real time. Whereas the hats for this show are things that you really can pack up. Uh, like here is a, a set of all the materials that you need and the rendering and the person's head size. And you need to make a mock-up of this and then now you need to make the hat version of this and somebody can take it in a box, at, you know, you pack it in a box, put it in your hatchback, drive into the theater. Somebody comes out, gets it out of the back of the car and goes away. And that's a safe um, exchange of, of goods without me at risk for COVID being in there, you know, all the time in enclosed space with a performer. So I've come to a point on my braids where with two of these hanks, I need to secure this with my clamp so that I can allow, so that I can unspool some more of these braids so that I can braid further. So this is exciting. I've gotten a lot farther than I thought I would. So now we're up to the point where, oh, I have a, a, about two feet of this now. So I, I think that, and can you see there up close how I'm, I've, I'm getting a wider braid and I'm getting a braid that has some interesting visual texture to it. So I'm very excited about using this as a spiral braid element in the construction of the rest of this bonnet. Um, yes, proof of concept, this is working. And I need to secure this braid now with my clamp so that I can undo these little, I, I think I might be, I, I haven't decided yet, but I, I might on this week's video, um, filmed video that releases Monday, I haven't filmed it yet. And I think what I might do is a how to on the way that you roll up braid in these figure eight braids. Um, this is actually something that I learned, a technique that I learned when I was fresh out of undergrad and I had moved to Boston and I didn't have any connections in the theater scene there. So I, I didn't 
you know, I, I was just sort of cold calling places and dropping off my resumes and hoping that somebody needed a costumer. And so the job that I, I took to pay the bills until I could get my foot in the door at a theater was I was a sales associate at Pearl Art and Craft in Central Square, Cambridge. And I worked in the craft department at Pearl Art and Craft where we sold things like knitting yarn and uh, children's craft kits and ribbon and fabric by the yard. And so I often, all of us who worked in crafts, had to measure, measure out yardage and then roll it up in such a way that if you just spool yardage of ribbon up, then it, it gets a curl to it. And the longer it stays in that roll, it, it just, it's not as smooth as if, if you roll it up in these figure eight hanks, then when the person gets at home and they start crafting with it, it, they don't have to unroll it from a spool. It comes off without any um, curl imparted to it. And it comes off without developing any spiral. So it, it's a really smooth and neat way to deal with quite a lot of yardage. And, but it's not intuitive. It's the way that you do it. I, I often have to demonstrate it to people two or three times. And I'm, I'm making this motion because that's, that's, you have to form your hand into this sort of hang loose perspective. Um, and, and the way that you wind the ribbon up, or the braid in this case up into a little hank like this it's it's not intuitive when i first started working there they had to train me how to do it i think three times before i really got it down and so i was thinking about doing an instructional video to show my viewership how to do it because it um then you could watch that instructional video three or four times until it clicks and you're like oh yeah that's right that's what i'm gonna do um Oh, I see Kim has dropped out of uh, the viewership on YouTube, so um, I don't have to say goodbye to her now. <laughs> no, I don't have to say goodbye to her. I won't say goodbye to her now, even though she's the only person who's been talking in the chat, and I see that there are other viewers there. Um, if you just joined me, welcome, other viewers. If you've been watching and lurking for a while, thank you for hanging out with me here in my studio stream. I'm going to hit this point. I think my Instagram is going to cut me off soon because you guys started a couple minutes behind the YouTube chat and we're hitting the point where I'm right at an hour, I see. So in closing up here, I've, I've spooled my braid back out and the next thing I'm going to do is braid further along. I've gotten myself a, a beginning section of this braided braid idea, stolen, not stolen, borrowed, from Denise Wallace Spriggs of the Huntington Theater. And I'm, I'm really excited about adding this textural element to my, my Regency bonnet in the coming week slash month, weeks, months. Um, it's gotta be done by March, so it'll be done by March. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and end the stream though. It is a little after four. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope I have not been super boring in what is kind of a tedious task, but I've had a lot of things to say about peripheral related stuff. Um, join me each week here in my home studio where I'm working on whatever I happen to be working on at the time. So far, it's been largely millinery. In the spring, it might change. I don't know that it will go congruent with my class because my class is dying. And I can't dye things here in this studio, and it would, I'm not sure if I can set things up in either my bathroom or my kitchen to do demonstrations with food safe dyes. Um, I think I'm gonna be recording a lot of lecture content though that may go onto the Instagram um, channel on those topics. So we'll see. The content may change, it may just stay millinery though, because I'm enjoying this time making hats, and there are, like I said, potential hats for playmakers in the spring. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm gonna cut off Instagram first because they haven't dropped me yet. 
Oh, it looks like maybe that didn't record. Oh, I can't figure it out. Well, this may be another week in which the recording only shows up on YouTube. It's going to post to my Open Studio Streams channel. So, we'll see. Um, thanks for joining me today. I've appreciated having your company as I've been working on this Spiral Straw Regency bonnet. And I don't know that I'll be working on it next week, but I will at least have progress to report. I might be moving on to something else. So check out Monday's video if you want to see that uh, how to wind up yarn, ribbon, any sort of strip yardage into a hank that unspools smoothly. And um, I'll see you next week. <laughs>